I learned to go towards pain. Grief and all of these emotions that I was stuffing down for years hit me all at once. And I was like, oh my God, I've been numbing myself for 10 years. It's time for me to just raw dog life and face it. What happens if I just never process this? I really need to start facing life, get in the gym, do the things I don't want to do. Like, what could my life look like if I just went towards all of this pain that I'm avoiding? You lost 30 pounds? More like 25. Well, maybe 30 now. I haven't weighed myself, but yeah, I had a good, I was at like 40% body fat when I tested myself. I did the in-body scan at Equinox. What is, what is that like to be a wellness influencer and yeah. to have this pressure of everyone watching you and looking for you as a resource for advice? Yeah. And then going to get that test and feeling like this isn't where I want to be. So the thing was, for years, I knew that my metabolic health was creeping towards a dangerous level. And in many ways, it was the fact that I was a wellness influencer and an entrepreneur and was so busy and so focused on work in my business that was driving that because I just wasn't taking the time for myself. And I think when I started as a wellness influencer, I didn't make it about myself or my looks, right? I just made it about the herbs. I was in school to become an herbalist. I made it about the education, you know, spent so many hours a day writing blog posts, talking about the gut microbiome and acne versus talking about my body and aesthetics. And here's how to use herbs to look good. So in many ways, it was it was fine for a while because people weren't like, OK, I expect her to have this perfect body or whatever. She's giving me advice about my skin and, you know, autoimmune disease. I don't need to look at her like this person that needs to be perfect. But it definitely got to a point where I was like, okay, I don't feel like I'm practicing what I preach and there's something wrong here. And that's when I started seeing my doctor, Dr. Gabrielle Lyon, who you guys have had on the show. And she was like, listen, like you, I know you're doing everything right. You're taking all your herbs. Like most of your lab markers are good, but you have far too much body fat and you don't have enough muscle and you're insulin resistant and your blood sugar is creeping up. You are in the pre-diabetic range. So you need to start making some changes and you need to start caring about your aesthetics essentially because that's what's going to get you to where you need to be metabolically for longevity for your aging and for your brain. So um yeah it was it was interesting because I think people sometimes people would make comments about it most of the time they would just kind of respect that I was giving them so much free information and just kind of take it but it definitely got to me at times because What, what do you mean comments? Like they would just be like sometimes people would say how am I supposed to take advice from you when you're when you don't look the way that you know, you should look or <sighs> whatever it is. And I, well, I get that to a degree, right? It's like taking I financial do. advice from a poor person. I I'm do. I'm not trying to be mean about it. It's just honest. It's just like, you know, like yeah. I get like, there's, but no, there's I no also to be don't it. agree with you because there, people have different iterations and different chapters in life. And if you, if you don't acknowledge them, especially as a woman, because you yes. stay consistent as a man. Yeah. <laughs> well, not all men stay consistent, but, but you'll say that, but I, to, to, on this topic, you know, I think that again, we, we do things and learn things on this show that keeps me accountable. Like I do the thing. I don't just like, I don't just wake up every day. I'm like, Hey, like I'm fine. You yeah. know what I mean? Like we put You're in the gym. <laughs> yeah, put in the work. I don't, I, I mean, it's like such a touchy subject these days, but yeah, we're putting in the gym like every single day, you know, we're going and eating right and doing all the things. It's not yeah. easy, but yeah, Dr. Gabrielle Lyon's been on the show and we talked all about this on, on that episode. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's because again, when I kind of started being on the internet over 10 years ago, I was on like blog spot it was more that I had really severe IBS and I had really severe acne. So that's what I was trying to heal. And that's what I was looking for this information for. And I went viral on the internet for my acne videos. So it was never really about my looks. And I was so focused on that part of my journey and, you know, eating organic and eating a healthier lifestyle that I didn't realize you can't eat 10 organic cookies and still be good. Like I was just kind of focused on certain parts of it and my skin and all that stuff. And then I kind of had this second health journey, which is now, which is kind of my insulin resistance journey and my my weight, which has been really nice to share because to your point, it has shown people that it's not linear. You're not just the same forever. You have waves and you can have different issues come up, even if you're a quote expert. Part I just of- had a very similar journey with my implants. So I get it. <laughs> you get them and then you, you want them out. So I get it. I've you're so about- allowed to change your mind. <laughs> I, li- I like to change my mind. Yes. I know you're going to talk about this in a minute, but I've been thinking about it a lot. So the internet is still relatively new in a lot of ways. And I would argue that people like yourself and Lauren are like kind of maybe not first generation, but second or third generation creators, right? Like when, when Lauren started putting content out on the internet, the term influencer didn't even exist. It was like a new thing. Mm-hmm. Like what the hell is that? Maybe same with you. 
Um, but the reason I'm going down this path is, and I tell this because I have younger sisters all the time, when you're in your early 20s, like before you hit your 30s, it's really easy to kind of maintain, stay in shape, give advice. Like we've had a lot of young people on the show and they give this fitness advice. I'm like, well, as I've gotten older, yeah. I look down sometimes like, oh, shit's not looking like it used to. Yeah. Like I have to put in the work. Um, and I think we're also one of the first generations to kind of start that early and then age up and be like, okay, now I have to do different things because my body just doesn't respond the way it used to when I was 22 years old or 23 or 24. Does that make sense? Yeah. And I think one of the topics that's popping that I know we're going to talk about is building muscle as you get a little bit older. Because for me, it was always so easy to keep you know, body fat off until I started getting into like my mid thirties. And mm -hmm. I'm like, okay, now I got to like maintain muscle or else I just can't get the fat off. Yeah. I think we also just become more sedentary. I didn't yeah. realize when I was in college and I'm running from class to class or even in the beginning of my entrepreneurship journey where I was packing boxes myself, right? Like I'm literally packing my supplements into boxes, taping them up, taking them to UPS. As things kind of went on and grew and got bigger, I just became way more sedentary and I lost a lot of my muscle mass. So I think it's not necessarily that our metabolism changes in our 20s and 30s. It's that our habits change. And I just realized things got a lot more convenient. I started to outsource things, even like washing the dishes or meal prepping. And even that, like there's actually so much, um, you know, energetic output that comes from those little tasks. And now I'm very conscious of how much I move in a day and even doing things like chores. Like that's it's helpful. No, it's important. I think, you know, at Dear Media, we have obviously a lot of women that work here and they, we, we, do, we do these hot girl walks. I don't know if you've heard of those. I love that. Um, but I, you know, I kind of want to do the hot girl walk. Well, once in a while I do the hot, I join the hot girl walks, but I, but I want to start talking also to the team. If you're listening to like implement the hot girl, like lift weights a little bit because yeah. to the point, hot girl lift the hot weight. girl because, lift weights oh because my. because i think to your point <laughs> I'm, listen, i'll say it, people become what is sedent sedentary and they yeah. think that the walks and the food and this is enough but it's not enough yes and, and i'm not saying that to be rude i just know how this works because i've been a weightlifter my entire life like your muscle mass and your growth decreases as you get older and older. And it's why you see so many old people when they fall and hurt themselves yes. and break their hips. It's why they fall and die, right? They have no muscle and no structure to hold them up. And I, and I don't think a lot of young people, and I'm going to generalize women, especially because it's just not as normal as men lifting, yeah. realize how important it is to just, it doesn't have to be crazy, but a little bit of weightlifting here and there to build muscle is going to create so much longevity for you. I don't care about, not even necessarily the way you look, but longevity, health, your health span, you know what yeah. I mean? Hot girl lifting or weight? Whatever they well, got to do. Like, he said, "Hot girl lift weights yeah. a little bit." <laughs> yeah, hot girl lift weights a little bit. Is that not, yeah. not that's that? a really good. That's it's catchy. Because we got the hot girl walks down at this company, but I was saying once in a while, I, you know. But I agree with you, and I I think that it needs to be emphasized, especially in the wellness world, and especially as an herbalist. Even in the herbal world, my schooling was a lot about plant medicine, and mm -hmm. these plants can do X Y Z, and you can you know create this protocol for someone in this formulation. And for so long, I really did think it was just about the herbs. And I have a supplement company, right? Of course, I believe in them. But at a certain point, I started to think about this huge piece of our muscle and how it is an active organ and how important it, it is for our brain health as we age, not just being able to you know wipe our own ass one day and be mobile, but actually our brain health. And for me, a big catalyst is my mom. She has really advanced Alzheimer's disease. And um, my parents got really sick with COVID. My mom actually almost passed from it and was on a ventilator. And after that, her Alzheimer's got really bad. And that's when Dr. Lyons sat me down and said, OK, now you really see your mom's condition firsthand, right? And she said, for every inch that your waistline grows in your 20s and 30s, your brain actually shrinks. And this is when you have the opportunity to prevent that. And that was my huge wake up call. I'm sorry to hear that. Um, no, but I think it's important conversation because I think people, when you when you breach this topic or go into this subject, I think sometimes, especially as a man saying this, you, you get pushed back thinking that it's it's for an aesthetic. Yeah. An aesthetic is a byproduct of feeling healthy and feeling good and doing these things. But it's not the, what I'm saying, and because I have an older dad too, and he, he was not lifting for a while. And I was like, hey, man, you got to you know take care of yourself. Because I saw a lot of his friends kind of getting sick and going. And I don't think people realize how important it is to maintain solid muscle structure as they age, not only for their body, but for their mental state of mind and, you know, so many other things that you, you just can't get from a solid diet and a couple of walks. Like you should still do mm -hmm. all the herbs, all the plant medicine, all, all this, all the stuff you can do. But you, you have to kind of maybe think about implementing that as you get older. Yeah. When you look at Olivia before talking to Dr. Gabrielle Lyons to after, tell me what what your day to day looked like before and what it looks like now. 
Well, it's funny because I started with the walks and she was kind of like, all right, it's not enough. It's not enough. And I, I would do walks intermittently from time to time or do a little something and try to just be active and get the 10K steps. Um, and most of my day was spent really just at my computer, just working away at my business, just kind of like hold up in my house, maybe taking a few walks, eating like quinoa, thinking that I was getting protein from quinoa. Um, definitely overeating and also um, binge eating. That was that was also a big thing for me um, that protein helped me so much with because Dr. Lyon taught me about the concept of protein prioritization, which is this phenomenon where animals will instinctively feed all day and not stop until their protein requirements are met. So we'll feed on carbs because even a carbohydrate rich food is going to have some protein in there and the body recognizes that. So it's like I actually need way more of these cookies that have one gram of protein so that I can meet my protein requirement. Um, so, yeah, beforehand, I was eating the wrong foods, overeating, definitely binge eating at night and letting the stress of entrepreneurship totally just kind of take over my life and keep me sedentary. And now my mindset is so different in the sense that I learned to go towards pain. I learned that there is no greater reward than putting your body through a really difficult challenge because that's what's going to get you the result that you want. And it's going to train your brain to actually be able to handle challenges in your regular daily life with a lot more resilience and grit. So um, now I go to the gym three times a week. I learned to take up space. I literally take off my shoes in the middle of the like lifting corner with all the guys and we'll get up on the stand and start doing step ups and Bulgarian split squats. And I'm oh, those are the worst. They are the worst, but I love them so much. And I'll be grunting and I'll be in pain and I'll be messy and gross. And I have learned to absolutely love it because that is so much more powerful than a walk or cardio or all the things that I grew up thinking were going to get me the metabolic health and body that I wanted. Were you more plant based before this whole revolution? Yeah. I was plant-based for a while. I even did like the, the medical medium diet. The, the <sighs> celery one? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Where it's like you just eat raw fruits and vegetables for 28 days and you're not allowed to have any oils. And Is that like a reset or is that an actual diet? No, he, he tells people that it's this diet to heal all of these chronic illnesses and autoimmune disease because he says that all of these illnesses are caused by latent viruses in the body and the only way to kill those viruses is to eat raw vegan essentially. And my health was just declining more and more. And now, I mean, I have protein for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. I ordered three sausages, two hard-boiled eggs, and a little chia pudding this morning for breakfast. Like, I pound back the animal foods, and I feel so damn good. There's like a real, I mean, we're obviously not the only ones talking about this right now, but more, you know, we do this all the time. More and more people, and a lot of women are coming on and talking about this topic, how they've started adding in animal proteins. And I think for for years, I mean, done this seven years, it was a lot of the opposite. It was like these cleanses and these things to, you know, yes. you know, what, what, not like fad diets, but what are the things where you like feel like you had to not me? I guess it's called a cleanse where people were like doing things because they Juice had cleanse. Yeah, yeah. All these conditions. You did it with me when we first started the skinny confidential. That is a TBD. A yeah. TBT. That was TBT. TBT. And you, yeah. You, that was, that was kind of gross. Um, those cleanses really get things <laughs> going, but no, but I, I think it's interesting because I'm, I'm like seeing this pendulum swinging and as hosts, we've been getting some pushback here and there from people that are maybe still plant-based or of the vegan community or are not ingesting animal products. Mm -hmm. But there's also at the same time, this like flood of different people coming on saying, Hey, I've done these things and my mm -hmm. life has either oh, yeah. improved by X, Y, or Z. And it's, I just think it's an interesting observation for us on the other side, because a lot of people I think are confused. They're like, well, is it plant-based or is it meat or, or what is it's the answer? Both. You know? It's gotta be both. My thing is plants and protein because you absolutely need plants and fiber, especially when you're eating so many animal foods to shuttle away cholesterol and make sure that your cholesterol is not going up. You need um, fiber in order to help your gut produce short chain fatty acids so that your gut lining has the proper integrity and stays intact and you don't get leaky gut. So you it's like fiber is going to do more for leaky gut than something like bone broth will. So plants play a huge role. And I think you have to have a perfect balance of both. And unfortunately, for a long time in the wellness world, it has been very black and white, this or that carnivore or totally plant based. And the truth about wellness is that it's not sexy. Like the actual way to health is not sexy. It's not a clickbait title. It's the tiny, consistent things you do each and every day. And that's not sellable or marketable. Yeah. The carnivore people aren't going to like me saying this either, but I think that that is not right either. No, here's the, here's the thing. There is a lot of people, I think, that have addictive personalities mm -hmm. that 
instead of drinking or doing drugs, are picking a diet. Okay, and that's like evangelicalizing it. Yeah. Yes. So they're making it like almost like a religious. Ex- yeah, like it's like almost like a like a sexy way to package an addiction. Yeah. This is what I've this is my observation. It's just what you said, though. It's not all all something all it's it, that's too intense. Yeah. I feel like it's it's right to just sort of pick and choose what works. And sure, like eat extra protein and eat, and eat plants. But people that are like, you can only eat testicles. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. Or you can only eat meat or you can only eat plants. It's it's there's a little bit of an OCD addiction there, no, in my I, opinion. I also think people are just way too hard on themselves. So like life is hard, right? You talk about yeah. the struggles that you're going through with your mother, like, you know, people's you know, life, people have tough relationships, stuff with children. All this. Life is already hard and they make it harder by saying, I have to stick to this very particular strict diet. And mm-hmm. if I ever go outside that diet, I'm, either, I, you know, I've done wrong. Right. Yeah. I think that I think they're also lied to by the people selling those diets. Yes. Right. Well, There's the a cortisol huge interest. is just it's not good for your. I mean, you know, it's like the stress hormone in your system is not good for any kind of longevity. Right. And so like you mm-hmm. may be doing all the right things, being so stressed about a diet and you're just com- completely killing all the results that you're getting in the gym or whatever else you're doing because your stress hormones are all whack because you're too strict. I went and got a facial from a friend in San Diego the other day and she hadn't seen me for like eight months. And she was putting my hair back for me. And she said, what are you doing with your hair? And I was very proud of that because I have been working very, very hard on really concentrating on making my hair the thickest and shiniest it can possibly be. And the supplement that I'm using for my hair is Nutrafol. It's the number one dermatologist recommended hair growth supplement. And it's clinically shown to improve visible thickness and strength. And I feel like I've been able to be a guinea pig with this because I've really been taking it through all the stages. And I know that millions of Americans experience thinning hair, especially postpartum. It can be a real bitch. Mine wasn't thinning, but I felt like it was shedding. So if you are dealing with thinning hair, if you're shedding, Nutrafol is absolutely amazing. It supports healthy hair growth from within And it targets the root causes of thinning. So think stress, hormones, environment, nutrition, lifestyle, and metabolism. And it does it through full body health. They literally did like a full research study and 86% of women reported improved hair growth. So test it out, especially if you're in your postpartum phase or you just want thicker, more luscious hair. Take the first step to visibly thicker, healthier hair. For a limited time, Nutrafol is offering our listeners $10 off your first month subscription. You also get free shipping when you go to Nutrafol.com and enter the promo code SKINNYHAIR. Find out why over 4,000 healthcare professionals are recommending Nutrafol for healthier hair. That's Nutrafol spelled N-U-T-R-A-F-O-L dot com promo code SKINNYHAIR. That's Nutrafol.com promo code SKINNYHAIR. Symbiotica, one of our favorite brands on the planet. We just had Shervine, the founder of Symbiotica, on this show for the fourth time. I think it's a record. We were trying to figure that out on the show. How many other guests have been on four times or maybe one, maybe two? And I can't think of them off the top of my mind, but four times, you know, if we're having somebody back that often, it's because they really know their shit. They're very interesting. They have the answers that we're looking for. And Symbiotica has become integral to this. We take so many of their products. We recommend so many of their supplements. One of my favorites is their vitamin D3 and CoQ10. They have just such an incredible line of supplements. I think the go-to that we were talking about onto the show is even if you're just starting with their vitamin D3 and their B12 and their magnesium, that is a solid base for anyone to get their foot in the door. What I love about these supplements is you actually eat them. It's like food. It's not like taking just a pill. You eat this stuff and you actually digest it. So it's a whole different delivery system and you get a ton of benefits from doing so. Symbiotica products are made with the highest quality bioavailable ingredients and the most advanced delivery system, like I said. And like always, we have an exclusive discount code for you. Just visit symbiotica.com slash skinny. That's C-Y-M-B-I-O-T-I-K-A.com slash skinny for 15% off site wide. If you're just getting started, I would definitely, like I said, start with the vitamin B12, the vitamin D3 and CoQ10. I think those are absolute game changers that are going to completely enhance your life. 
Again, symbiotica.com slash skinny for 15% off site wide. Enjoy. I see it as there's a lot of people out there with chronic illness, more than ever. It's exploding. There's a lot of people who are suffering and a lot of people who are suffering with gut issues specifically or things like autoimmune disorders that stem from their gut issues. So, of course, they're going to notice that, hey, when I cut out certain foods or when I eliminate this entire food group, I'm starting to feel better. And then they're going to find someone out there who has 80 percent of the story. Right. Who's saying, I've found the thing. This is how you're going to totally cure and heal your body. Just come with me. Follow me. And that, you know, essentially vulnerable person is going to believe that because they're struggling. Right. And they don't have a practitioner to guide them. And they're just going to the Internet, just trying to grab onto whatever they can. And they're going to find that, yes, by eliminating plant foods, perhaps by eliminating fiber for a period of time, they end up feeling a lot better. Their, you know, colitis flares go down, their IBS flares decrease, their acne gets better, and they think this is the diet forever. But the reality is they probably have a dysbiotic gut microbiome that when they are eating that plant fiber, it's producing the wrong types of end products. Instead of producing the happy short chain fatty acids, it's maybe producing methane if they have SIBO, for example. And all of their symptoms are coming from their gut bacteria and the way that the gut bacteria are metabolizing those foods. So it's not the foods that are the problem. It's the gut bacteria. And unfortunately, those people aren't working one on one with a practitioner who can test their gut and tell them that and slowly help them to reintroduce those foods and treat the imbalances. We talked a little bit about thyroid. Yeah. Speaking of imbalances and a lot of women especially are dealing with thyroid issues. Yeah. What have you seen in your line of work when it comes to thyroid hyper, hypo, Hashimoto's, all the things. Yeah. So when it comes to just hypothyroidism where there's not that autoimmune component, in traditional herbalism, we would see this as a cold and damp tissue state because back in the day, right, people didn't have blood draws and labs to look at and TSH to read. So the way that people would treat someone who was presenting as hypothyroid back in the day is that they would say, "Okay, this person has cold hands and feet. Their digestion is very cold when food is going in. It's not going into a warm um, digestive fire with logs that are burning. It's kind of sitting there. It's fermenting. They have slow gut motility. That's the constipation aspect. Um, And even their personality might have this lack of vigor and fire where they're feeling depressed because that's a huge symptom of hypothyroidism. So traditional herbalism would... um, treat that in a way where they would see that person needing warming and invigorating herbs that now we know have these mechanisms that not only energize the person like adaptogens like ashwagandha, not only energize the person by rebalancing their HPA axis and tonifying their adrenals, but these are also anti-inflammatory herbs that are taking care of those underlying chronic inflammation aspects that are preventing their own thyroid hormone from either converting to the active form or going into the cell, which is what we talked about earlier, where T3 can go reverse. Um, And then in other aspects, like if you wanted to look at it in Western terms, a lot of um, hypothyroid disorders are either chronic inflammation, again, stemming from gut health, or um, a lot of the times it's stress because we have this HPAOT axis in our body. It's not just the hypothalamus pituitary adrenals. It's also the ovaries and the thyroid. So the brain is constantly telling the thyroid what to do. Any kind of endocrine or glandular issue is always stemming from the brain because the hypothalamus in the brain is what's perceiving the stress in our lives. So if the hypothalamus is like, hey, I'm chronically in fight or flight mode, I'm constantly stressed about this relationship in my life or trying to survive working three jobs or whatever it is that we're perceiving as stressful, it's going to downregulate the rest of that axis ending with the thyroid. And it's going to tell the thyroid to produce less hormone or it's not going to convert the hormone properly. Um, And that's the same with hormone imbalances. Even the ovaries are just doing what the brain is telling them to do. It's not the ovaries that are the problem. Often it's the brain. So in a holistic sense or as an herbalist, a lot of what I would do with someone who has hypothyroidism is look at the stress in their lives. How can I support them with herbs to help increase their resilience in the face of that stress? So again, that's adaptogens like ashwagandha. That's why studies show ashwagandha can actually normalize thyroid hormone for some individuals. Um, But also that's looking at how can I make them more resilient, period. Weightlifting is a big one. It really changes the the way that you perceive a challenge and thus the way that your brain perceives stress in general. 
Is that weird that I also feel like for me, cold plunging is what you just said about weightlifting. And I know you're going to yeah. tell me that you're going to tell me you don't like cold. I don't. I, don't I know. Love it. I knew you were going to tell me that. <laughs> but I knew it. That's why I brought it up. It's fine. It's a hormetic stressor. <laughs> I I am addicted to it. I love it. Yeah. I, I think I saw on your Instagram that you said you don't like cold. Tell I don't us love why. it. Go, go for it. Tell yeah. us why. I mean, basically in Chinese medicine, you want to do every single thing that you can to preserve your yang chi, right? Your your warmth. Because as we get older, you look at people that are much older, they're cold, they're more tense. They would be that cold tissue state that we see in herbalism where it's like, okay, there's not enough fire and circulation in that person. Older people have circulation issues, cold hands and feet. They're very wiry. So as we get older, we get colder, period. We lose our digestive fire. We lose our m- metabolic health, our metabolism. And so in Chinese medicine, you want to, to preserve that fire as much as you possibly can, especially if you're a woman, because exposure to cold will enter certain channels, including the womb, essentially. So you want to keep cold out of your womb because often, um, you know, for example, when you have really heavy cramps, a heating pad is helping because it's helping to bring warmth and blood flow to that area so that this your body's not... sounds like good not... birth control, though. Yeah. <laughs> Well, I'll tell you, I'll, I'm getting in the cold. I'll Sorry, be, Olivia. Yeah. I need some birth control. <laughs> but but it's also everyone is so different. It, and, and it is a hormetic stressor, right? It's like a little bit of stress is really good for an organism. So you're not sitting in a cold plunge for two hours, right? You're doing it for maybe five minutes. So it's essentially a little bit of an exposure to something that's less than optimal that's helping you become stronger as an organism. I actually have a question about this really quick. And I feel like you're the perfect person to ask. Why, though, when I get hot, I get inflamed. But when I get cold, I tighten up. So I I think that's why I'm so attracted to the cold. Yeah. I mean, people can have inflammation that's of a cold nature or of a hot nature. So again, someone with hypothyroidism, they're not going to have heat symptoms. They're going to have cold hands and feet. They're going to have circulation that's stuck. They're going to have digestion that's just sitting there. There's not enough fire and heat or stomach acid in Western terms to convert that food and actually digest it. So their inflammation is going to stem from cold. Your inflammation perhaps may be of a hot nature. Everyone in herbalism has a different constitution and tissue state. And so in an intake with you, I would ask you questions about your mood, your sleep, when your symptoms arise, what they feel like in your body. Do you have redness in your skin or do you have dullness in your skin? And we would look to see if you're someone who has more of like a heat based inflammation and perhaps apply a little bit more neutral or cooling herbs for you. Whereas someone who's just very cold and has just like no fire, no lust for life, we're going to warm them up and give them lots of cinnamon and heating remedies to move things. I'll give you something to think about. I'm not going to, I know I'm not going to be able to convince you on the cold on this episode, maybe another time. But one of the the benefits of doing cold periodically, not all the, because yeah. you're, like, you're not going to sit there for five, 10 minutes. Yeah. I always tell Lauren that's, that's overkill. But if you did like, I'm in there for like a couple times a <laughs> week, maybe two like, to three minutes at a time. What it does when you get out, one of the best things after the cold is to let your body naturally heat itself back up. Because yes. what it's done is it's tra- it trains your body to be able to heat back up when it gets cold. Yeah. So for me, it, because I've done it for a while, if I get cold, now my body's used to heating back up and I can heat up real quick. Okay. So to, what is it? The yang chi? Yeah, your so yang chi. So, so I think like your it's a way to kind of stimulate your body coming down in temperature and then being able to self-regulate itself back up to get warm again. I think classical Chinese medicine would say that you're using a lot of your reserves. You're pulling from a lot of those reserves to get your body to heat back up afterwards. And those are reserves you're going to want later in life. If I die. You know what? Hey, I can hear both sides of the argument. That makes sense. (laughs) If I don't make it to 100, I'm going to I'm going to call you up and I'm I'm going to say you you were right. I shouldn't have got that. And again, it's it's really just tradition. And all cultures kind of have this concept. You'll hear Eastern European grandmothers say, don't sit on the cold concrete. You know, don't let your back or your butt or your kidneys. It's going to get into your uterus. You don't want the cold in your uterus. Right. And in Chinese medicine, again, a lot of the ways that acupuncturists will treat infertility, for example, is having the person not eat cold foods and take warming herbs and use moxibustion on, you know, the the uterus area. So, um, you know, all of these cultures have this. And and one example that my acupuncturist would always give me is, you know, when you get in the shower and your period stops, like you'll be washing your hair. And like when you're in the shower, you don't really have your period. You're not really bleeding. That's true. Yeah. So water is yin. Water is cold. Even if it's hot water, water by nature is a huh. yin substance. And it's hitting this point in your head where we want to keep covered with a hat. You want to keep your head warm all the time to preserve your yang chi. So a yin substance is hitting this point on your head and letting a lot of cold in your body. And that cold is stopping the flow of blood 
through your uterus. So that's why when I go in the cold plunge with my period, I'm just kidding. Oh. <laughs> well, See, here's I'm the thing. Fuck with you. I would <gasps> I would just not cold plunge on your period. That's great. I don't cold plunge on my period. Okay. I, I don't want to. I mean, I guess it wouldn't go because that's hitting my thing on my head. But I mean, I'm not cold plunging on my period. I wonder if that stops the mood stuff too. <laughs> I'm, just, I'm just kidding. I'm, yeah. Okay. Calm down, everybody. But it's it really is just this concept and this traditional thing. And I really do respect tradition because it, it got people here for thousands of years and. There's got to be something to it. But I also don't discount that if it works for someone, it works for someone. It's. I'm going to you know, report back in 70 nuance. years. 70 yeah, years. Good. Oh my God. <laughs> see, if I, see if I make You're going to say you're right to someone? No, I said I'm going to report back. Mm, I don't know if you're going to say you're right to someone. I've never no, no, heard no, you I think, say no, that. I like having these conversations because I think this is, again, like cold, sauna, the, all these things are becoming more, you know, yeah. topics of conversation. Everyone's talking about them, right? And we've, t- we've definitely talked about it on the show many times. I mean, if you think about longevity, like people in China and Asia in general live for a really long time and they will never water, order ice water at a restaurant. You will, they will always order hot water. Kids oh, are always eating porridges. When you, it's amazing the results that I've seen in kids, for example, with, um, asthma because in Chinese medicine, stomach is the mother of the lung. So the stomach needs to be strong enough and warm enough to actually feed and nourish the lung chi. So a lot of times kids who have asthma early in life, they're doing a lot of cold milk and cereal for breakfast and some processed foods and just switching them over to oatmeal, warm cooked foods in the morning can help dramatically with their asthma because of that stomach lung relationship. That's why my grandma's always yelling at you to not let the baby get cold. My grandma's fully Japanese, like full exactly. Japanese. Exactly. Right? And she um, yes. always yells to, to, to not let the babies get cold. She even yeah. gets mad if it's, it has a little zipper. No, you know? she gets mad if there's the little snaps. Yeah. Kind of their, yes, metal. because there's yeah, there's yeah. wind that gets in and yeah, yeah, wind yeah. is also very harmful. I mean, there's yep. certain opportunities in life that we have to build and preserve our yang chi. And so, she's like 97. So maybe exactly. You're right, you know? So when you're a baby, that's one time when like keeping your baby warm, you're giving them the best chance to to preserve their yang and their zen chi, which is going to carry them through digestion and growth for the rest of their life. But also right after you give birth, you actually have a chance. You, you have this opening of this portal, essentially, right? These channels. Um, and you have a chance to rebuild your yang chi and get more warmth than you for those 40 days. So that's why also in the Japanese culture and the Chinese culture or even the the Mayan and now Mexican, Colombian, et cetera, cultures that stemmed from Mayan medicine, there's this period of quarantine after birth where for 40 days you keep yourself covered, you keep the windows closed, you don't shower, you don't go outside, you maybe do a ginger sponge bath just to clean yourself but you don't let cold or wind in and you preserve that warmth and eat soups for 40 days. Lauren, your yang shi is probably a little Whoa, cold. Whoa, my yang shi is not. I was like, I went out to dinner like two days after I gave birth. Your yang shi is, you need to get your yang shi. I have, and I am not one to follow with that. So do not take my advice. Go zip Just yourself in a up. sleeping bag and do fucking ginger scrubs. I Just am not. bundle up. I, listen, I am about balance. I, You're good at the no shower part. I am good at the no shower part. I was yeah. going to say that I don't let anything hit my head ever, barely, because I never wash my hair. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not a big hair washer. I'm just not. I don't like, I think that my hair looks better when I wash it like every week and a half. Love that. Sorry. <laughs> you gotta do what works for you. Intermittent fasting. No. What are your thoughts on that? Go go wild. My biggest thing in life is now preserving your, your muscle tissue and also, again, protecting yourself against unnecessary stress because especially women, we have enough stressors. I think men's bodies are different. I think that a lot of the studies that are done on intermittent fasting were done on men. And I think that because of women's physiology and biology and because of how sensitive we are to signs of famine due to our biological drive for maximum fertility, that any period of, oh, my God, there's not enough food, there's not enough fuel, I need to now tap into my reserves is going to stress us out. So um, even for me, like on I've worn a CGM before because of my high blood sugar and insulin resistance. And I noticed that when I would wait too long to eat in the morning, when I would kind of have that hunger and ignore it and get into the hanger and get around 10 a.m., 1030 a.m., my blood sugar would actually start spiking because I was going into a state of stress and I was having this high cortisol moment where the cortisol was good, essentially, because it was liberating some of my glucose stores, right, and helping my liver to produce some glucose um, and release some glycogen. But that on a hormonal level, that cortisol was just only furthering my HPA, OT axis dysfunction and the other things that I had going on. So what time do you eat in the morning now, especially if you're weightlifting and what do you eat? Within 30 minutes of waking up. 
And if if you take a thyroid medication, you have to wait an hour, of course. 30 minutes of of waking up? Yeah. Yeah, within 30 minutes. What do you do? Shove an egg in your mouth? Five eggs. You eat, that's a, that's you. so Gabrielle Lyons, eggs. right? Is that Gabrielle Lyons? Of that's course. what she said. That's 30 grams. Well, I'll right? do, yeah, I'll do like, I'll do two eggs, three egg whites, a little bit of sausage, some fruit, or like some chia pudding. I try to get fiber in each meal. So I'm really liking chia or some beans or something like that. It's so hard to eat right when I wake up for multiple reasons. Yeah, but, but eggs are easy because they go quick. Having kids and make, I got to like do all my morning routine. So it's just like protein powder and water. That's what I'll do. Sometimes. You know what I might do though? I might just get like hard boiled eggs that you can no, buy. I think those are harder to eat than the regular because you have to chomp the whole thing. I mean, I do hard boiled eggs just because I don't like the extra fat. So you, don't eat, you don't eat the full yolks? I, so I see egg whites as like a protein supplement, right? Like it's essentially why are you eating protein powder? Because it's a whole lot of protein and not a lot of carbs and fat. It's just very yeah I economically good calorie speaking, right? Or like energy speaking. So I see egg whites as this extra protein supplement where I'm getting it from whole food instead of using a protein powder. Not that I don't use protein powder, but I just kind of like to add some extra egg whites to my breakfast meal because they're so little. They're easy for me to just get down and swallow. And I'm just bumping up that number. And for me, if I I will binge eat at night if I don't eat more than 30 grams of protein in the morning. So are you just huh. doing like almost body weight in pro or in grams of protein per day? Roughly? Yeah, just roughly. about. I mean, when I was in my um, weight loss phase, I bumped it up because you're in this catabolic state where you're breaking down your own tissue. So you need to eat a little bit more than your body weight in protein when you're in a caloric deficit. So what specifically, because our audience is going to want to know. And like, how recently did you implement that? Um, So I was in my like fat loss muscle building phase from like September to let's say what month is it now? May. So until like April, I guess. So what were you eating detailed? I was eating 140 grams of protein per day because my ideal weight for my height, I'm like 5'2". So my ideal weight is 120 pounds. And what does that look like? Tell us exactly. You said five, okay. you said two eggs and and egg white in the morning. Yeah. So I would do... people struggle to get the protein in. Yeah. I would do two full eggs, three egg whites, one or two sausage links, and then a whole bunch of fruit on the side. Or I would do some leftover carb. Like I would roast a lot of squash because squash is high in fiber. It's also high in water. So it's a very high volume food and you can eat a lot of it and feel super satisfied for not a ton of calories um, or carbohydrates. So I would have like squash with my eggs, for example, and I would just drizzle a little bit of hummus or a little bit of pesto. You know, I'm not a masochist. I'm not just going to shove plain Mm -hmm. hard boiled eggs down my throat, although I've been known to do that. But I'll dress it up a little bit and add some nice flavor and whatnot. So always eggs, sausage and fruit or just eggs and fruit or eggs and squash from the night before, or even eggs and rice from the night before, whatever I had to just make sure that it was protein, fat and carbs. Um, and then I would just eat a lot of leftovers. I would just meal prep a whole lot of chicken thighs, asparagus, squash, Japanese sweet potatoes. I would throw those in the oven and just have like a vat of 10 of them in my fridge. And I would do a lot of mini meals as my snacks throughout the day because people are like, oh, my God, what can I snack on? And I definitely have a lot of snacks, too. Like, I love cottage cheese. Low-fat cottage cheese is an amazing way to get a high-protein snack in. I'll put a little uh, a little bit of, like, pumpkin seed butter or tahini on a rice cake. Put some cottage cheese on top with some blueberries and cinnamon because both blueberries and cinnamon are great anti-diabetic foods. They actually help to resensitize your cells to insulin. So I would try to incorporate these medicinal foods and spices as much as I could. Um, but I was just constantly snacking on some chicken and sweet potato throughout the day. And I just learned to love it. I, I think a big part of it for me, especially with my history of binge eating, was learning how to enjoy simple foods to actually retrain my brain and reset my dopamine sensitivity a bit. Because I was so used to eating hyper palatable foods. It, it, like it's very unnatural, essentially, like what we have access to in the the pinch of a pinch of a moment. That's not a phrase, but You know, we have so many foods that are packaged that are very high in sugar, fat, salt, and flavor, right? Like that's the magic combination that lights up these dopamine receptors in our brain. And throughout the last year or so that I did go on this weight loss journey, I also went on a little bit of a dopamine journey too, because I was looking at what am I getting from food? What where else am I getting this dopamine hit from other substances? And I just did this whole kind of life edit and looked at all of these ways that I was seeking outside of myself and seeking pleasure in a way that was actually bringing me closer to pain. I that totally makes sense. It's almost like you retrained your taste buds. I did. It's I did the same thing in Austin the other morning I was in my kitchen eating deer for breakfast. 
And I'm like, that. if you would have told me that I would be eating deer, yeah, like two years ago, I would have been like venison. I'd venison, be like, yeah. what, what, uh, what? Venison's delicious, but it's so much protein, and I, I, I enjoy meat now. And two years ago, I would have told you, no, I don't enjoy it at all. So you mm-hmm. almost do retrain your taste buds. Well, you have to. Don't what you are, notice too now that you eat like that that it's sometimes when I get bombarded with stuff with a ton of different flavors in it, I actually like it kind of like shocks my system yeah. a bit because. To your point, I don't think it's so natural that we like evolved with all of these flavors at uh, abundance, right? It was like we grew up with, or we evolved with simple foods. Yeah. And so now I'm much more sensitive to it. Or, like I eat something like, oh my God, this is like, too, it's too much. Yeah. What no, are some true. other dopamine things that you had to cut out? Are you talking about like alcohol? Are you talking about, sh- I mean, obviously sugar, what? I first tried Vita Clean in my guest bathroom. So I wanted to just test it out and see how I felt about it. And what I noticed immediately was that the rash that I get on my legs, sometimes it was like an itchy leg, went away. And so I noticed myself starting to always shower in the guest bathroom. That is when I knew I needed to bring my VitaClean shower filters into our room too. So I put them on both of our shower heads and I am obsessed. So much so that I am in San Diego and I brought one to San Diego. If you're unfamiliar with VitaClean, it's a triple filter vitamin C infused aromatherapy shower. And basically what it does is it removes the toxins and the nasties from your shower. It prevents product buildup in your hair and calms skin irritation. If you are investing your money and your time into like a 10 step skincare routine or you're very serious about your hair, you don't want to be showering in non-filtered water. We did a whole episode on this because I just think it's so important for people to understand that they're paying so much for skincare or they're investing in their hair and then they're showering in water that is non-filtered. The VitaClean showerhead is the best kept secret for glowing skin. And also I just already can tell that my hair is shinier. I'm obsessed with it. It has like a super strong jet pressure and it uses vitamin C to filter out chlorine. This is amazing because I am in the pool with my kids a lot. The VitaClean is amazing and they have a code for you. You're going to go to VitaClean.co today and use code SKINNY at checkout for 20% off. That's VitaClean.co, V-I-T-A-C-L-E-A-N.co to get your new showerhead today. Use code SKINNY at checkout for 20% off showerhead starter kits. And if you don't like it for any reason, they offer a 30-day money-back guarantee. That's VitaClean.co. Quick break to talk about one of our favorite partners. This has been a game changer for our pets, and that is the Farmer's Dog. As you guys know, Lauren and I are definitely dog people, and we want to give our dogs the best food possible. This is why we typically stay away from things that come in pellets, that are burnt, that are smelly, that can last for months and months and months, and we stick with fresh food. Similar to humans, you don't want to be giving processed food to your pets. Obviously, we want to take care of them, give them the best food possible, which is why we chose the farmer's dog as a partner and why we choose them as the food source for our pets, Slim and Boone. Lauren and I spend so much time preaching about health and wellness and taking care of our bodies and nourishing ourselves properly. And so often people are neglecting their pets, just grabbing what's most convenient off a shelf, not doing enough research. When we decided to start changing our dog's diets, the farmer's dog popped up because we wanted to give them real food. You want to feed your dog real, fresh, healthy food with whole meat and veggies, gently cooked in human grade kitchens to preserve their nutritional value. What I love about this company is their vet developed recipes for as little as $2 a day. So it's definitely affordable. They're pre-portioned, their meals arrive in pre-portioned, ready to serve packs, conveniently delivered on your schedule, convenient and fresh. Dog people all across the country have ordered millions of meals from the farmer's dog. It's never been easier to invest in your dog's health with fresh food and you should definitely start to do so now. Like I said, we're sitting here worried about all the stuff we put in our bodies and so often our pets get neglected. With the farmer's dog, you never have to worry about that. So to check it out, we have an extreme generous offer get 50% off your first box of fresh healthy food at the farmersdog.com slash skinny plus you get free shipping just go to the farmersdog.com slash skinny to get 50% that's the farmersdog.com slash skinny go to the farmersdog.com slash skinny to get 50% off your first box and free shipping enjoy farmersdog.com slash skinny so for me um alcohol never really lit up my brain I can take it or leave it but cannabis was my thing like I was just really really, really into smoking weed. And I did that like as I built my business, I I started smoking when I was like, I guess, 18, like around the time I started my blog in college. And I smoked 
every day until I was 28 and I'm turning 30 now. Um, so I realized that, hey, this this is an issue and I'm relying on this as an emotional crutch. And I think that in our society, it's not seen that way. It's this recreational medicinal kind of plant. And, and there's a lot of work being done to destigmatize it and very rightfully to get people out of jail who are there um, because they were selling weed. And now we have all these dispensaries and it's it's a terrible situation. So I don't mean to add to the stigma around cannabis. But for me, the way that I was using it not ceremonially, not in a way where I was respecting the plant, not in a way where I was listening to the plant when it was like, you got the message that I needed to give you. I'm done with you. Stop. I was using it as a way to dissociate and, and get away from my emotions and get this dopamine hit. Um, and I heard Rich Roll on a podcast once describe addiction as a narrowing of what brings you pleasure. And I noticed that all I really wanted to do was hang in my house and smoke weed. I isolated myself further and further. And that was kind of the catalyst to... Um, what got me on this journey because I had a, a period of time where I couldn't smoke for like two weeks and all of a sudden grief and all of these emotions that I was stuffing down for years hit me all at once and I was like oh my god I've been numbing myself for 10 years it's time for me to just raw dog life and face it so I quit cannabis in uh January of last year I quit caffeine in April which was wild wild because I really Forever, wanted or just like you're done with Still, I, I mean, I'll have it once in a while, okay. but I don't want to go back to needing it. Like and, and I, I just was on my bachelorette. So I drank it on my bachelorette because I was like, oh. I'm going to enjoy. Rightly but so. I try to really like I usually I have a, a rule where it's no two days in a row. I try to not do it twice in a row because then I just snowball. Um, so I, I quit caffeine because I just wanted to experience my brain without it. Like how what are my baseline happiness levels? How do I face life when I don't have caffeine to grab, when I'm feeling a little bit sad in the morning or I feel like I need to be productive? How would I work in a different way if I didn't have that push on my adrenals to just go, go, go? Maybe I would find a more creative flow. I just wanted to experience my body without substance. And then I quit, quote, sugar in September when I started my insulin resistance journey. And I thought I was addicted to sugar. But then I realized I wouldn't sit there and just eat a bowl of white sugar. That's not appetizing. So I can't be addicted to sugar. I'm actually addicted to hyper palatable foods, which is when you combine sugar with the fat, the salt, the flavor and all that. So I guess I, I more so quit hyper palatable foods for a period of like three months from September to November, or December. I just ate like whole foods. I just, again, roasted sweet potato, fruit, um, bananas. If I wanted something sweet, I didn't cut like carbs or cut like fruit sugar out of my diet, but I just ate real food for a few months and boring food. I really did it therapeutically and it changed my brain and I started to be able to enjoy simple things and like sitting in the backyard without my phone. What was the, I mean, you mentioned your mother, but was that the catalyst to have this huge life change? Because I think a lot of people yeah. listening, they're like, okay, easy for you three to say, you're doing these things, you're, you know, working yeah. out in the gym, you're eating, trying to eat right. But like, I always think there's like a catalyst that people need in their lives in order to say, OK, I'm hitting the reset switch and kind of starting to implement better choices for myself. Yeah, I think for sure it was my mom. And again, just both of my parents getting so sick with COVID. That's when we started to realize, oh, people with poor metabolic health have worse outcomes. Um, and both my parents were like massively overweight my whole life. I also was very overweight as a kid. And I just realized like I could easily go down their road if I don't do something now. Um, and then, yeah, it was essentially when I stopped, when I had to stop smoking for those two weeks in January of last year, and I had a lot of grief come through about my mom, I was just like, what happens if I just never process this? Like, who am I going to be if I just keep all of this stuff? And I really need to start facing life. I really need to start facing hard things, hard emotions, get in the gym, do the things I don't want to do. Like, what could my life look like if I just went towards all of this pain that I'm avoiding? I think that's, a, well, I think that's a really solid perspective to have. I, I, I think we've got into a place where, where people sometimes go the other way, right? Where it's like, oh, that's tough. I don't want to face that. And then like, what I think what I try to point out with Lauren on the show all the time is like, at some point you're going to face it. Yeah. That's, but to your point, like it, it's going to rear its head in a really ugly way, potentially, if you don't deal with it earlier. Yeah. I think it's like what Warren Buffett and Charlie Munger say, like when there's a problem, they found that it's better to just solve it as soon as possible than to let it linger. But 100%. we do the opposite, right? Yeah. And I think that we try to avoid pain by going towards pleasure. And I did that for so long to the point where pleasurable things didn't feel good anymore. I was just smoking to feel normal. I wasn't smoking to enjoy it. Or I was just eating sugar because we're like eating chocolate because that's what I did. And that's just the tool that I had at my disposal. I wasn't enjoying it. 
And I just felt like I was so numb to life. And I was going through a lot of depressive episodes, too. I would have this major, major depressive swing, like like clockwork every three months or so. And since I've, you know, kind of gone on that dopamine journey and and taken a bit more control of my life and started to go towards pain, which is a much healthier way for your brain to process than going towards pleasure. I I haven't had a depressive episode in maybe like eight or nine months. It's it's wild. I've never I've always had depression. Always. What has your experience been with your relationship with your phone? You mentioned something about you being outside and getting being off your phone. What is there? Was there an unhealthy relationship there? Yeah. Yeah. I think that it's like a brain that seeks pleasure will try to seek it wherever it can. Right. It'll try to get that dopamine wherever it can. So you take it was kind of like this journey of, okay, I took away the weed. Okay, I took away the coffee. Okay, I took away the hyper palatable foods. Now I'm grabbing my phone a lot. Now I'm shopping a lot more. I was like, the root is still there. Um, so I just started to, A, once I stopped doing the other things, once I stopped overstimulating my brain with caffeine every day, because I think I'm just really sensitive to caffeine, it became a lot easier to put the phone down and just be with my own thoughts because I wasn't on overdrive. Because I think that when I was consuming caffeine every morning and my brain started to go crazy and I was like, grab the phone, it's to-do list time. It's like you almost need a tool or a device in your hand that matches the speed at which your brain goes. Like I couldn't even write in a notebook because it, my, the thoughts were coming too fast. So not having the caffeine helped me to just slow my brain down a little bit. And that helped me to feel more comfortable not being on my phone as much, even though it's still very hard. And I would say that that's the final addiction that I'm kind of struggling with. That's it's the, the one boss. thing. Yes, yeah, the final boss. But I find that spending time with people really helps. And that's really what I need more than anything is is more connection with humans. Um, and I know that there's studies like the Rat Park study where they when they enriched a rat's environment with other rats and, you know, kind of made this amusement park, this social amusement park. They, they did not want cocaine. Um, and I think that that's kind of like the last thing that over the years, as I used work as an addiction and was like, no, I need to build my business. I can't hang out with people. I can't have fun. I'm just going to sit in my house and smoke weed after that long day of work and just isolate myself further. I think I actually took myself away from people for a really large portion of my 20s. And after COVID and after everything that happened with my parents, I was like, wow, people are actually all we have. And that's been a beautiful antidote as I've been kind of weaning myself off the other things. It's weird, though, because if you look back on 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 your 20s, it's sometimes some people would look at it and say you isolating yourself got you to where you are. Yeah. But and Tony Robbins always says this. Sometimes where something gets you to where you are is not what's going to take you to the next level. And yes. you have to almost switch it. And it's like you have to almost be grateful. Yes. That you isolated yourself because it got you to where you are. But it's maybe not going to serve you for your next stage in life. I love that. Imagine if they gave humans a bunch of cocaine and said you can go to an amusement park. I don't think it would work the same way as the rat study. <laughs> We'd be like, I'm going to get on the ride with yeah. the cocaine. Imagine <laughs> if we gave you cocaine. Humans are the worst. <laughs> Can you imagine him on cocaine? Humans, that, oh my God. See, I love it. No, that's why the cocaine would not. We be can't good be trusted to run the world because you if, can't you be trusted on study, cocaine. We did the rat study and the rats didn't do it. But humans, I feel like cocaine. You and rats, honestly, you on cocaine. My yeah, friends are going to be like, what did you talk about on Dear Media? I'm going to be like, cocaine. I um, I have not done cocaine because I'm self-aware <laughs> enough to know God. that I would go to the <laughs> fucking moon with that stuff, yeah. you know? But see, it's like, maybe you're like me. We have this addictive no, no, personality. I, you would also That's why I don't do cocaine. Because it's laced with baby locks. I, um, I know what can happen to me in certain situations. Yeah. why I've been with the same woman for so long. I just like to be in a box, regulated, stuck... Trapped. I'll be in the box you if there's wanna, no cocaine. I don't want to be around anything that I lets can't me imagine. give a uh, live life on my own devices. I don't. I just want to <laughs> be right here. Right Insulin here. resistance. This yeah. is something that I think a lot of people deal with and they don't really understand it. Give us a kindergarten level explanation of what it is, how we can implement practices into our day to support it if we have it and how to get tested for it. OK, so on a kindergarten level, Insulin is like the key that opens the door to our cells and lets glucose in. So essentially, we eat glucose every day in the form of fruit, in the form of sweet potatoes, in the form of bread. All of those things break down and turn into simple glucose. And that glucose goes into our blood so that it can travel into our cells. And once it gets into the cell, it gives us that beautiful energy that helps us do the things we need to do for our day. If glucose can't get into the cell because there's 
the cell can't hear the insulin, right? So it can't hear that there's a key there that opens it up to let the glucose in. That glucose hangs around in the blood and all of a sudden we have high blood sugar. And over time in your labs, you'll find that your blood sugar, as you become more insulin resistant, as you have more time of that blood glucose hanging around and causing inflammation of your tissues in the blood, over time, you will have blood glu- a fasting blood glucose that's 90, 95, 100, 110. For, and for that's, perspective, what is a healthy level? A healthy level is 85 or below in the okay. functional range. Okay. And then they try to put you on metformin. Yes, which, I mean, metformin also has a time and a place. There are certain people that are simply, A, not going to take herbs or make lifestyle changes and, and need a medication. And there are certain people that might not have access financially to certain herbs and lifestyle changes that also need a medication. So if there's going to be someone out there who's going to keep eating the standard American diet and doing what they got to do, metformin is a wonder drug. But we're speaking to the people who are in the wellness world and have access and financial privilege to herbs and all this good stuff. And we can do things differently. We can kind of take the natural metformin, let's say, through so, diet and herbs. Okay, so keep going. So if it's 100, 110, like Yeah, what, so what, that's what where what you point? become. It, once you're um, Once you're above... 90 essentially like the 90 to 115 range you're considered pre-diabetic okay and that is where you have a chance to really reverse that pre-diabetes once you're above 115 and you're in that type 2 diabetes range you can more so manage your condition and sometimes you can reverse it with with diligence you know you're kind of using your diligent diet as your drug right and you're dependent on that um but Mostly once you have type 2 diabetes, you can manage it. But a lot of your listeners who are just insulin resistant or who have PCOS and they haven't been diagnosed with type 2 diabetes yet, they've just been diagnosed with PCOS. So they're just insulin resistant and they're in that pre-diabetes range. That's where you have this beautiful opportunity to resensitize your cells to insulin and also to build muscle because muscle is your disposal site for that excess glucose. I'm going to ask you a stupid question. How long, maybe there's not a you know, specific answer to this. How long can you stay in that pre kind of diabetic insulin? Like range? some people can stay there for years, you okay. know, and I think that that's a lot of women in their 20s when they slowly start to notice that they're getting puffier, that their periods are getting longer and more painful, that, you know, they're starting to have like chin hair growth, that they're, um, you know, like all of these symptoms of PCOS that come up in your 20s when you start to experience insulin resistance. So you, you have can time be, to re- you have time. Yeah, you can okay. be insulin resistant for, let's say, 10 years before you go into full blown type 2 diabetes. Um, but sometimes you're in that range and you have all of these unexplained symptoms and you're gaining weight. And now when you eat carbs, you're really sleepy, even though before you could totally process carbs and be fine. Um, and your doctor is saying, oh, well, you know, your blood glucose is normal because really the functional range of prediabetes is like 90 to 115. And the functional range that you should be at is 85 or below. But most conventional physicians, if you're in the 90s or even the early hundreds, will say, oh, you're, you know, you're pretty much normal. You're fine. It's like when men get their testosterone measured, like, oh, you're in the normal range. But the normal range is Mm -hmm. not it's not the it's not the ideal range. I would say that. Yeah. Yeah. You can also look at your fasting insulin. It's not quite as accurate because it's going to be somewhat reactive to the meal that you ate the night before and the time in which you ate. Um, But for me, when I was very insulin resistant before I lost weight, before I I saw all of these changes and built muscle, my fasting insulin was like 11. And Dr. Lyon was like, we need to get that down. And then halfway through my journey, it was at a seven. And now it's at like a four, which is ideal. I like to see it five or below. And do you have to wear one of those glucose monitors to figure out what it is daily? Or is it just a blood test every two months or so? You can just get a blood test. You can also look at your HbA1c. That's a really powerful marker because HbA1c is going to give you a snapshot of your, your glucose for a three to six month period, let's say mostly three months. Um, and so if your HbA1c is 5.7 or higher, you are considered pre-diabetic. So you want to be below like 5.6, 5.7. Um, but you can just get that taken. Yeah. You can get your blood drawn every three months. You can look at your fasting glucose. You want it to be 85 or below. You can look at your HbA1c. You want it to be 5.7 or below. And you can also ask your doctor to test your fasting insulin and see if that's five or below. I'm going to ask you another question because I know a lot of the audience that's sitting there, there's like, I'm never going to do a test. And there's some of them are saying that. Mm-hmm. What are some of the, you highlighted some of these, what are some of the symptoms or things that you would notice if you were insulin resistant? Yeah. You're going to be really tired after meals. You're going to eat a meal that's rich in beautiful carbohydrates, like fruit, even healthy carbs. You're not eating cookies and sugar. And instead of it giving you energy, you're going to feel a crash. You're going to feel the itis after your meal. You're going to feel heavy and sluggish and not have energy. Um, You will notice that you're gaining weight more easily over time. You're going to feel like your, quote, metabolism is slowing down. But in reality, you're actually just 
not able to utilize glucose for energy and you're probably a lot more tired and thus more sedentary. Um, and you can also notice hormone imbalances. Insulin resistance is a huge driver of hormone imbalances in women because what happens is when you have more insulin over time because you're insulin resistant. So your body is like, okay, let's let's increase this because the cells can't hear us. We're just going to send more insulin out and hope that the cells open up to get this glucose in. Your insulin is is high over time and chronically elevated insulin tells your ovaries to start producing testosterone instead of estrogen and progesterone and especially instead of progesterone. So all of a sudden women start to get symptoms of PCOS where they start to have androgenic acne, which is like these um, these like angry kind of like the chin and cheek pimple, pimples. It's a very specific type of acne that comes from androgens. They also start to have head hair loss as well as body hair and chin hair growth. So you'll have kind of hair loss around your crown. That's really indicative of high androgens because the ovaries are producing testosterone and you'll get a lot of chin hair. You'll have thicker body hair growth, waxing. You'll have to do it a lot more often. Um, and you'll have longer cycles. So instead of a 28 day cycle, you're now going to have a 35 day cycle, a 40 day cycle. You might have symptoms of infertility. You might have um, cysts on your ovaries and you might have poor follicle health. And you might also not be ovulating because as your um, ovaries start to produce more testosterone in response to high insulin, your body also produces more luteinizing hormone. And you need your luteinizing hormone to be low throughout the month and then high in a big spike when it's time to ovulate because that is the LH surge that signals your body, hey, there's this big demarcation. But when you have high insulin, your LH is high all the time. So your body never even sees that demarcated spike and it never ovulates. So you can have anovulatory cycles that can be a cause of infertility or you can just not ovulate and not get your cycle for years. So what are like five things that you would do if you were insulin resistant? Number one, build muscle. A a lot of times insulin resistant resistance comes from simply not having enough muscle tissue on your body because muscle is the most insulin sensitive tissue that the body makes. It is going to be the dumping site for all of that glucose in your diet and it's going to help you actually metabolize it and use it as fuel. So you have to start building muscle before you even start trying to lose weight. If you are overweight and that's part of the picture, you want to start gaining muscle and you can do both at the same time. But You want to be in the gym, resistant training. Number two, eating enough protein, because that's going to support not only the growth of that muscle, but perhaps the loss of fat at the same time, because you can eat less, but still eat enough protein to maintain your muscle mass. Um, Number three, you're going to want to utilize insulin sensitizing herbs. So or medications, right? That could be metformin if you want to go the Western route. If you want to go the herbal route, that could be something like berberine, right? People, you hear a lot about berberine. That's kind of like a natural metformin. I don't love berberine. I think that there's more effective herbs. For some people, it's great. Um, But I see more success with other insulin sensitizing herbs like cinnamon and ginseng and gentian and fenugreek. Those are some really great ones that not only um, help your cells become more sensitive and aware of insulin, but they also help to increase your body's endogenous GLP-1 levels, which is what Ozempic actually does. So those herbs kind of have a twofold action. Um, You're also going to want to take walks after meals. That's number four, because any sort, even a 10 minute walk after meals can drastically lower your postprandial glucose spikes, which lowers your inflammation and helps, you know, again, continue to reverse insulin resistance. And another great thing you can do is take um, vinegar before meals. Vinegar has not only been shown to slow the, um, the conversion of starches that you eat in your diet to glucose. So it kind of slows the post-meal glucose spike from carbs, but it also helps your cells and muscle uh, and muscle tissue utilize glucose from your meals more effectively. Did you make your bitters product because of your insulin resistance experience? Exactly. Okay. So you would use this. You just gave it to me. I just tried it. You would put it in a tea or water before you eat. Yeah. So what I was doing is I was taking the herbs in this formula separately in capsule form. So I was taking a whole bunch of capsule right, capsules like, of all these different herbs. So much work. And I was also taking vinegar before meals because huh. the acetic acid and vinegar, again, is so effective in that twofold manner. Um, so as an herbalist, I was like, we love vinegar tinctures. Herbalists either tincture in alcohol, vinegar, or glycerin, which isn't quite as effective for tincturing. So I was like, I could just tincture all of these herbs and extract their phytochemicals into a base of vinegar. And then all I have to do is take a dropper of that and you get 500 milligrams of the herbs in just one dropper. And you always do it before you eat. 
before I eat a carb heavy meal. So if I'm eating, if I'm having like a low carb day, if it's like a rest day for me and I'm not really eating a lot of carbs, I don't need to take it. And um, this is the one that has the same ingredients or similar ingredients as Ozempic. Talk to me about yeah, that. Yeah, I wouldn't say similar ingredients as Ozempic. Yeah, expl- so <laughs> explain what you mean by that. So Ozempic is... going to fly off the shelf now. <laughs> Essentially, Ozempic, Wagovi, Manjaro, all of the different brand name drugs have the same active ingredient, which is semaglutide. And semaglutide is a synthetic version of a gut peptide hormone called GLP-1. Now, the beauty of Ozempic and Manjaro and all of these drugs and why they work so well is that this synthetic version not only stimulates our own GLP-1 receptors in a really strong way, but the synthetic version of GLP-1 doesn't degrade quickly the way that our own GLP-1 degrades. So it stays in your system a lot longer. So people who take Ozempic are full all day long, never have food noise, never have cravings, never even think about food because what GLP-1, this gut peptide hormone does, is tell you, hey, I'm satisfied, I'm satiated, I'm full, I don't need to seek for anything, we're good, we're not hungry. So people with Ozempic, who take Ozempic, they're not hungry all day long. And also what GLP-1 does it lowers glucagon, it increases insulin release, it lowers postprandial blood glucose. It has all of these beautiful metabolic effects too, right? The, this hormone that we make that is now available in a synthetic form. What herbs can do is stimulate the production of our own GLP-1 to a lesser extent than taking a synthetic version of it, but it still happens. There's still this, this effect that you're experiencing. So what people notice when they take glucobitters is that their cravings are less. It's not the zero cravings that Ozempic gives you where you can't even look at food, but their cravings are a lot less and they're able to tolerate, okay, I can have one bite of dessert and be done right there. This is really weird. You're not even going to believe me. I just had two of these in my tea, maybe three because I'm intense. I can <laughs> Um, but I swear to God right now, I am not hungry. It's amazing. It really I'm, does I'm help actually with your not appetite. Hungry. I, I'm like not even joking, bullshitting. And the last time I ate was, I don't know what time is it. It's, I actually want to look at this. It's I. It's 420. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and um, I ate at, I want to say one o'clock. So I, it's about time for me to be hungry mm-hmm. again. That's the beauty of GLP-1 oh, stimulation is weird. that it's it's a gut brain axis peptide. That is weird. So it actually um, gives you this feeling of gut distension, essentially. It, it activates your um, enteric neurons and your intestinal nervous system, essentially. And it gives you this feeling of fullness or distension. And it literally quiets your brain noise. So because you just took glucobitters, you're feeling that that feeling's not going to last all day. You're going to be hungry for dinner. Someone who takes Ozempic is going to never be hungry, essentially. That's why they lose so much weight. Um, but it really does help. And when you take it before a meal, you're able to have much better portion control because you do have less of those hunger cues and you do feel more satiated from less food. Peter Atia was saying that that when you're on Ozempic and I'm not a scientist, so this isn't going to be eloquent, but he says that it like you're losing muscle, not fat. So that's the problem because people are not hungry. So they are not eating. They're not eating not protein. protein. <laughs> They're not eating enough protein. They're not eating enough calories, period. So again, they're experiencing this massive, rapid weight loss that they were never able to experience with any other drug. And because of that weight loss and and also the metabolic effects of GLP-1, they're experiencing improvement in their type 2 diabetes and their insulin resistance, which is beautiful. But unfortunately, in the long game, at the end of that road where you've lost all of this weight and a lot of it is actually muscle that you've lost because you're in a catabolic state and you're not eating enough protein to protect your lean muscle mass— you get off the drug and your body fat versus muscle tissue ratio is in a worse place than when you started, even though you're smaller. So you're actually going to be less sensitive to insulin once you get off the drug because you have less muscle mass. Muscle mass is the long game. I said this one time and people did not like it. People don't like it. I mean, I think people don't like to hear that there could be this miracle substance that they can take and it solves all of their weight loss issues and you know their aesthetic issues. What I keep trying to tell people and I have people like you on the show is it's really important for people to consider what the long term effect is on anything you're doing to your body. And that can go for if you add too much meat, if you add if you if you take all the meat away, if you're taking Ozempic, if you're taking too much alcohol, all these things, they have a compounding long term effect. Uh, And I think when I look at people that struggle in life, it's people that make short-term decisions time and time again. Like they don't think like, okay, I got to make a long-term decision for my health, for my family, for my life. Like, and so I try to be like a, a voice of that, you know, reason when I say like, listen, I know that 
many are finding success with this kind of thing. Yeah. But what does this look like in two, three, four years if you've lost the majority of your muscle mass? That's it's a great point. And also there are certain scenarios where something like Ozempic can be life saving sure, for someone. Of so I, I have a friend who's a registered dietitian in an inner city and some of her clients are on Ozempic. And these are people who are working two to three jobs, have no idea, don't don't have the time to meal prep high protein meals, don't have the funds to just buy a bunch of supplements and try all these different herbs. And for them, their blood sugar is so high that they're at risk for chronic kidney disease, because even though we think of blood sugar and insulin resistance from you know an aesthetic perspective, there's also the the number one thing that high blood sugar harms is the tiny blood vessels in your kidneys. That's, and that is, um, you know, there's merit there and that's different. I'm talking to the people that are 20 to 30 pounds, maybe yes. overweight or where they don't want to be. And they're sure. diving into this because I don't think they're understanding if you lose 20 to 30 pounds of muscle, how hard, I mean, you know, you're weight lifting. How up. hard it's it is so to put it hard. back on. And, and people get so focused on what the scale says and they don't realize yeah. when you start adding muscle, you're going, the scale is going to go up even if you start to get leaner and look better because the muscle is going to weigh more. Yeah. But when you lose that amount of muscle in that period of time, it is so fucking hard to gain it back, especially as you age. And that's the problem with yo-yo dieting. And that is also what I watched my mother do my entire life. She would go on crash diets. She would lose a whole bunch of weight. And then she would gain it back, but she'd gain back just fat, even though she just lost muscle. So she would constantly put herself in a worse and worse place than when she started. And I used to do that with her. I was at Weight Watchers in sixth grade and was like, oh, great. I can just eat this little amount of food and my weigh in is looking great and everyone's praising me for it. And I it's really sick, the like yo-yo dieting industry and even just what's happening now with Ozempic, where it's people that are using it just for weight loss, not for a medical need. And they don't realize that they're on another crash diet, essentially. Well, we have a, we're have we very good as humans of kicking the can down the road and saying, oh, like when that happens, I'll solve it later. But I, I keep trying to tell people like, I mean, you know how hard you're working in the gym now. And oh, my God. It's, yeah. It's not easy to go do this. And as you get older, 40s, 50s, 60s, trying to put that muscle on if you if you lose too much of it at a young age is going to be really challenging. A woman who's in the gym working out to failure, like max weight, like to failure every set can put on an average of 0.5 pounds of muscle a month. That's not a lot of muscle. No. And that's going to the gym three times a week and killing yourself to do that. So it's you can lose that a lot quicker than you can gain it. Yep. Before you go, what are t- let's do five because tens a lot. Five wellness things that you do that are non-negotiable. Now, I would love for yours to have some herbs in it. Like maybe you put cinnamon in your coffee, whatever it is. But yeah. also like I'm sure you scrape your tongue. Give us all the like <laughs> little things that you do. Um, So I would say number one is I do a lot of nourishing infusions. So I think like multi-mineral supplements are all the rage. And I love my my peak electrolytes and my Kintan minerals and whatnot. But um, plants are the original multi-mineral supplements. So a lot of the times I'll take some dried nettle or some dried oat straw and I'll fill them in a mason jar, pour hot water over them, close the mason jar, let it sit on the counter overnight. And the next morning you have an incredibly magnesium, calcium, uh, silica rich infusion of all of these minerals. That again, it's, is so it's nettle cool. And what? Nettle and oat straw. I can't oat with straw. you right now because what the oat straw? here's why I can't with you right now. You three years ago, like it, I had trouble getting you to drink water. And now you're like, oh, what brand of nettle is it? Like, oh, yeah. I, I, I and listen, I've never heard of oat straw. So oat straw's is amazing. It, do you have a tea that we can do that with? I don't, ha- you know, I should, uh, I should have one. You gotta do a tea. I should have one. But honestly, it's something Call that it mineral tea. I don't even want to commodify it because all you need to do is just go to an herb store and get oat straw. Like it's, you don't even uh, need that's to. that's overwhelming. I'd rather just buy it online. <laughs> so can you make it cute? And like, well, I, we I probably have you. some old oat straw. In the, yeah, I don't like, yeah, the, I'll go to yeah. an herb store and get oat straw. Like, or you can, you can just order it online. <laughs> I think Lauren buys those, those things for just Yeah, aesthetic. but I need to know that it's non-G, uh, non-GMO yeah, yeah, yeah. and that it doesn't have pesticides and organic. And I feel yeah. like if you just made one that's called like mineral tea. Well, for now, Mountain Rose Herbs is a great supplier. Okay. They're a really good supplier. They have organic herbs. You Will can you get, send me the so, link? So, so, yeah, okay. I'll send we it to So what does it do? Go ahead. So um, it's it's like the the straw like kind of grassy part of the oak oh, plant. No, 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 but I'm saying what does it do? Sorry. Oh, oh, it's Sorry. just packed with minerals. Everyone's because... yelling at me saying, you sh- idiot, you should know what oat straw is. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. No, know explain it to me. in order, essentially, like the, the magic of it is that you're leaving it on the counter overnight to steep. So you're doing boiling hot water. You're pouring it over the oat straw. When you have a mineral rich plant like that, you need two things, heat and time to kind of crack open the cell walls and get all the minerals out. So you're leaving this overnight infusion on the counter. You're waking up in the morning, you're straining it, and you're just getting this this massive infusion of bioavailable plant-based 
min- uh, magnesium, calcium, silica, and more. So it's all, it's and a your hair word. is amazing. So Thank I get that probably, I swear, has to yeah, do yeah, with, yeah. with, that's a secret, a beauty secret. Yeah, a huge beauty secret for sure. And it's also great for kids because um, it's delicious. It's a really, you know, benign, non toxic, nutritive plant. It's like eating oatmeal, essentially. It's another part of the oat plant. And because kids need so many minerals for their growing bones and teeth, um, it's a great way. You can just put some honey in it, give them, you can do it chilled for kids. We're going to do it. It's really good. It. Yeah, love that. Um, another think, non, yeah, we learn on the show. I'm telling you, that's why. <laughs> another non negotiable for me because of my long history of digestive issues is taking digestive bitters before a meal. So this is an herbal one, but it doesn't even have to be herbal. I do have a digestive bitters product in my line, but you can use any sort of bitters. Green tea is a bitter. Dark chocolate is a bitter, you know, technically. Um, or a long steep of chamomile tea is a bitter. Any sort of bitter plant that you're ingesting before your meal is going to um, essentially stimulate your bitter taste receptors on your tongue. And it's going to start this digestive cascade that tells your body, hey, it's time to produce stomach acid. It's time to release digestive enzymes. So instead of even taking a digestive enzyme or an HCL supplement, this is nature's top down way of telling your body, hey, it's time to eat. And this is what people did for so long. They would have like a a bitter digestif before their meals or like an aperitif. Um, like the Swedish bitters is a good example. People would have like endives or bitter greens as a starter for their meal. People have been doing this for for centuries. Um, So I have digestive juice in my line. That's like my bitter spray and you can just spray it on your tongue. And gluco bitters is my digestive bitters formula for people with insulin resistance. Got it. So you so if you have insulin resistance, do this one. Yes. But if you don't, you can use your spray. You can use digestive uh, digestive juice. Yeah. Okay. And um, also bitters because of the stomach acid release, they help to prevent gas and bloating. Really good for when you're traveling, just like a good hack to have in your purse. Another non-negotiable for me, um, I would say, is nervous system regulation. Again, going back to the HPA OT axis, everything is going to be off if your hypothalamus is perceiving stress and you're letting your body get into that state of fight or flight. So I think just having a really good toolbox that I can draw from where I know, okay, you know, it's it's nighttime and I'm starting to spiral a little bit. I'm anxious or I'm wanting to binge eat or whatever it is and realizing that I just need some time to be with myself and ground my nervous system, whether that's taking a bath, whether that's doing some breath work, whether that's doing some self massage and actually like feeling my own body and being like, hey, you're good. You're here. Like talking to myself. Um, those things I think are are enjoy it while you don't have kids. Irreplaceable, exactly. Enjoy your self massage, exactly. And your fucking bath <laughs> and your red light therapy. I have to squeeze at the fuck in. It is so annoying oh. in the morning. I'm just being honest. Enjoy it. You know what? I appreciate the honesty, and I think that it's like you said. It's it, if I didn't have that isolation in my 20s, I wouldn't have what I have now. Got to be grateful for it. And if you didn't have this time of like, oh no, I don't have any time for my routines. You're, you're not going to have your beautiful babies right by your side. You know, growing up with you. Lauren has. Pl- I'm hanging on by an oat straw. <laughs> yeah, yeah. The kids, the, the kids kind of derail a few things. Whenever okay. you know. What's what's fine, what's your other ones? Do you um, have two other more? ones. Number four is there's this stretching video that I do. You guys can look it up on YouTube. It's called Jessica Smith Doms, like delayed onset muscle soreness. It's this 26 minute stretching video from this very nice woman who's like Frenchie is in the video. I am obsessed with this video. I I need so much stretching because of how much tension I hold in my body. And also because just like my fascia gets really tight and I'm stressed out and I'm at a desk all day. And also I need stretching for my emotional health. I think it moves a lot of emotions. I will do that video at least every two to three days religiously. How long are you guys here for? Um, until like tomorrow morning. <laughs> oh, you guys, next time you come here, I have this woman. Her name is Kata and she does flossing and it's fascia stretching at the road. And I am so addicted to this situation. It, 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 she, I will feel pain in my body and I will go see her and immediately regulates your nervous system. It sounds, I'm going to go look at Jessica Smith Doms. It sounds like it's the exact thing she does. Well, it's, it's not necessarily like some crazy body manipulation. It's just this really lovely guided stretching video where I always feel like a new human after I'm done with it. You're kind of like swinging your leg at one point. You're just, you know. It's it's it normal. sounds like flossing because flossing okay. is gentle. It's not okay, okay. it's not like intense. I'm yeah. not like in this crazy. It's it's yeah. gentle 
fascia stretching. Yeah. I just think people don't stretch enough, period. Yeah. Like how often do you intend, like there's so many other wellness routines and like kind of things that we would productively fill our time with versus stretching. We don't well, take here's it the thing too. When you're weightlifting, like you and I are, you have to. The, the synergistically, especially as a woman, it's so important to stretch it out too. Yeah. Because you will, I, I mean, I think that I can tell like a difference even in like, this sounds weird, how the muscle shows up when I'm stretching. Yeah. Go ahead. Um, and number five, I would say non-negotiable. I take a, an adaptogen every day. I have um, I have two adaptogen blends in my line. One is called adrenal recovery, which is for people who are more so like overworked, you know, moms who are like at the end of their rope. It's just a really nice rounded blend of adaptogens. And then I have an adaptogen blend called Thyropro, which is for people who have hypothyroidism. So it's like a specific thyroid based adaptogen that helps with the stress piece of thyroid disorders. So it sounds like I need to try the thyroid one. I think we we included it, right? Or did we do adrenal? Or should I I'll try adrenal? I'll take the adrenal. One. Okay. One. Okay. Yeah. Do not touch my yeah. bitters. But I, I just love adaptogens. Adaptogens are really beautiful plants because they're like, you know, a, a lot of herbs can also have side effects just like pharmaceuticals, but adaptogens are specific because they're non-toxic and you take them in food like doses so they're essentially nutritive and they increase your non-specific resilience to stressors. They basically help to regulate the feedback loop, which is your HPA axis. And I think that in our modern world, everyone needs an adaptogen. Can we do a giveaway and a code for the audience? Absolutely. OK, can we give away like all your favorites, like a big organic Olivia yeah, basket? Let's do a big box. Um, we can do like our best sellers and then also my favorites. Um Definitely so, get the glu the gluco bitters. We're gonna do gluco bitters. We'll also do our digestive like juice. Like okay. I just love a good digestive bitters. We have peace juice, which is like a spray formula for anxiety in the moment. Perfect. Um, and a whole bunch of main magic is like our hair formula. And then yeah, let's do a code. We usually do ten percent off. That's perfect. But no, no, no okay. we can do fifteen with you guys. Amazing. Let's do code skinny. Okay, code and skinny. Then uh, to win the Olivia organic Olivia basket, all you have to do is follow at organic Olivia, right? On yeah, the, organic underscore Olivia because I was taken. Organic underscore <laughs> Olivia on Instagram, and then tell us your favorite part of this episode with Olivia. I know there's probably a lot on my latest post at Lauren Bostic, and we will send one of you a big giant basket. Olivia, where can everyone shop? Find all the things you can shop at organicolivia.com. I also have a zillion blog posts there about all different um, health topics. You can find me on Instagram at organic underscore Olivia and also at shop organic Olivia. That's more our brand page where we have info about our formulas, DIY recipe videos and whatnot with using herbs. And then our podcast is called What's the Juice? You got to come on our pod. I would love to. And honestly, you were so great on a mic. Thank you so much for coming on. Come Thank back you. anytime. You have a great team. <laughs> They're the best. These um, girls are everything. Missing Donna. We love you, Donna. That episode went six million directions. I loved it. Thanks I for did. coming on. <laughs> Thank, Thank you.